bunch of sermons out of this, and uh, I want to speak to you this morning something that was provoked. I think sometimes we ought to be uh, spontaneous in our sermons, and so this morning I got up and looked at the trees across the street and the trees along the, my property line and saw the, the glistening ice that was hanging there, and I was waiting for a car to drive by, but in 15 minutes, no one drove by. And so uh, uh, eventually two cars did drive by, but not before I was drawn to this passage and thought, well, okay, Lord, if this is what you want, then this is the way that we shall attempt to go today. Psalm 73 was a psalm of Asaph. Asaph was the chief of the musicians of the music in the house of the Lord. Uh, We might call him the choir leader, the choir director, the music director, Uh, a number of titles today probably that we use could have been ascribed to him, but suffice it to say, nothing was utilized as far as music uh, unless it passed through Asaph. And uh, he was responsible to see that that music was appropriate, uh, that it was uplifting, that it was all of the things that music needed to be. Oh, for some Asaphs today, and thank the Lord for the ones we have here at Hope Baptist Church. I am thankful for our music program. I travel quite a bit, and uh, as I get out, I find the one thing I'm always thankful for is the music back home. And so thank you for that. Having said that, let's read because Asaph is not in a good place. How many of you have ever been told we need to find our happy place? Asaph is not in his happy place when he starts writing this psalm. Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. I have two little question marks drawn there. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They're not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, how doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. I think he thought in verse 15 this psalm was never going to make its way into the scripture. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then... Understood I their end. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places and castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors as a dream when one awaketh. So, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved and I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee, and thou hast holden me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? There is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a-whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. If you were to stop midway through this psalm, you might come away with a really bad idea. 
Because his perspective, his thinking, his uh, aim in this first part is not at all what we would consider to be something that should come from one who follows the Lord and serves the Lord. He gives you several reasons here to just throw down and quit. If you had adapted his ideology or adapted his thinking at this point, you might have indeed walked away having read just part of this passage. Asaph is really discouraged. As a matter of fact, he's more than really discouraged. He's really, really discouraged. And because of that, his thinking is all messed up. Christian, you need to understand that when you begin to move away from the Lord, we always tend to think in the life we live in the realm of blessings and possessions. How many times have you heard somebody say, well, you know, if you don't walk with the Lord, you're not going to get all the good stuff. How many times have you not gotten something good and your immediate response is, Lord, what am I not doing? So it's an idea that seeps into the very essence of what we are. If I do good things, God gives me good things. I do bad things, God gives me bad things. And, and to be honest with you, we are his children. And for that reason, God gives us good things. And even sometimes when we are bad children, God gives us good, bad things and good things. Sometimes, no matter where we are, God gives us just the exact opposite. We have that inflow into our life, and it's not hard to say, I must be good because I got a good thing. We certainly thought, I must be bad because I got a bad thing. But the truth is, God gives gifts to his children. And Asaph, as he comes through here, is just kind of in a bad place. I want to focus on verse number 18 this morning and look at this, because this is the thought that occurred to me this morning, as I said, and painfully looked out across the yardway there. He says in verse 18, as it begins to dawn on a man who had completely lost right thinking, he says, surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. The idea was that he was praising these people. He was envious of these people who seemingly were doing everything in opposition to what he was trained and taught to do. They were living a life that was completely contrary to his life as a priest and a servant and a child of God. Their life did not measure up by biblical standards nor by his standards as a follower of God. They were the those people. You say, who are they? Well, those people you passed on your way to church this morning that weren't going to church. Those people who live in the houses you passed this morning that weren't even going to bother to get out of bed and go to church. Those people maybe that you work with that ridicule and make fun of the idea that you're a Christian. Those people who would turn a deaf ear to the word of God when it was quoted or someone sought to give them guidance from it. Those people, you know what I'm talking about. They're all around us. We have next door neighbors who are those people. Uh, We have people we met in the grocery store who are those people. And as he looked at those people, he got a completely backward perception. But as things began to right themselves, I believe through the work of the Spirit of God in his heart, something dawned on him. And he said, surely thou didst set them in slippery places. I can tell you where this sermon originated. I can't do that with many of my, matter of fact, with very few of my sermons could I do that. But I remember being on I-75 coming south in Detroit one evening, back when my kids were all still in high school. I have 15 grandchildren now, so you know that's a long time ago. We had been up there for some school activity, and we were coming back home. And as we came into Detroit, did I say Cincinnati a minute ago? I said Detroit, I hope. Coming into Detroit, all at once, it was one of those scenarios where you're zipping down the interstate, making good time, carrying on conversation, just enjoying the ride home. And then you see ding, 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 brake lights. And uh, when I saw that, that uh, brake light in my mind went on, and I reached over and touched my brakes, and when I did, nothing happened other than all my wheels locked up, and we just kept zipping along. 
and I realized we were on ice. And uh, we obviously were not harmed. We were able to slow down. But for the next probably hour, hour and 15 minutes, we made our way through Detroit in an ice storm. And it was in that place. I had just read. I say again, this is one of my favorite psalms because I find myself here so often. But I found myself contemplating slippery places. And this morning when I woke up, I looked out and realized it was a slippery place, at least where I lived. And uh, you run that thought through your mind. Well, Lord, maybe we just cancel services and then I wouldn't have to go to church. And then I realized I was one of these people here he was talking about. And so I decided we couldn't go that route. But then I began to ask the Lord, say, Lord, I'm going to have to get out in some slippery conditions today. And this sermon came to mind, and I think it is a good sermon often to be repeated because of this fact that very often you and I are in places making decisions and going directions that, if we're not careful, can not turn out the way we think they are. Have you ever been in a slippery place? Have you ever walked away from a situation and said, boy, I'll never go there again, or I'll think differently if I ever have to experience that again in my life? I would guarantee you in this crowd that there are probably as many people as there are here an equal number of regrets by those of us who are here about some of the decisions we made in haste, without thought, without contemplation, and all at once found ourselves in a predicament where we could not rescue the situation. You know, when you're on ice, you're out of control. Uh, There is no doubt about it. It doesn't matter. You can have power steering and woofers and tweeters and and high definition and all that stuff you've got. And it doesn't matter at all in your automobile. You are at the mercy of the elements as soon as you find yourself there. And the scripture here, looking at these that in one instant he would have envied. He would have said, boy, they get all the breaks and I don't. I have to go to church on Sunday. And then in an instant, when he saw them in a predicament, then he realized the treasure of what he had. You know, sometimes we as Christians, we can cop an attitude. Well, you know, you can't do this. You can't go there. You don't even want to go to church. You're just going to give me something to add to the list of what I can't do. And I don't know why they have to always talk about that. You know, all that's well and good until the bottom drops out of your life. And then all at once you realize, boy, I need somebody here to tell me what I'm supposed to do. I need somebody here to give me some advice. I need somebody here to help me get through this situation. It's amazing how easy it is to reject the simple truths of the scripture until the predicament in our life is one we can't control. And then we want to come back and find out. What we're looking for there, though, is rescue. And in honesty, not everybody that seeks rescue gets rescue. God will give us the possibility of avoidance rather than rescue. Do you ever find yourself in a place and when you started praying, oh, God, help us, you realize, you know, I shouldn't even be here. What am I asking God to get me out of this? He told me not to come. I know I shouldn't be here. I know I shouldn't be living this way or doing these things. I know that I'm in this predicament, not because of God, but because of me. And you kind of feel about that big asking God to get you out of something that he's been warning you about for a long, long, long time. When you hit the ice, everything changes. You saw all those lights, bling, 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 bling. Literally, it was just almost like somebody flipped a switch and they started way down there and just came all the way back up to where we were. We got stopped. I remember finding this was in the days when they had just started building the roadways with that rough, almost serrated edge just off the other side of the white line there. I was in the fast lane, so you know how fast I was going. And I got, really got through that just by putting tires on that. While I was there, I saw two or three vehicles. My family was with me. We saw a semi-truck start in this lane and slide all the way over here and hit the wall. We saw several cars start sliding and slide into a car that just happened to be sitting there blocking their path. It was honestly a frightening time. The psalmist here said, thou didst set them in slippery places. Did you ever see somebody slip? It's a very embarrassing thing. There's no such thing as a graceful slip. And it's even worse when we try to make it look graceful. As though we planned, you know, to do that. 
you know. Yeah, you want to see me do it again? Uh, we, we try to cover it. Do you ever watch somebody slip and fall downstairs and get up and look? First thing we do, we look around to see what? Whether anybody's watching. Those are the moments when we feel on the inside, probably like we should feel on the inside most of the time. But we're consciously aware that somebody has been watching me and I have looked like a fool. And that's a frightening thing when we find ourselves there. But he said there, thou didst set them in slippery places. May I say to you, there are a lot of slippery places in the course of life. I think about our teens, I've been praying for them and some of them graduating, some of them moving up in school and uh, knowing the opposition that some of them face in a public environment and knowing what kind of a world they're going to grow up in. All of those things will captivate our prayers if we'll allow them. And uh, I realize that's a really slippery place to be. Moms and dads, someday when your kids get on the school bus and head down to the public school, it would be wise maybe for you to realize that they're headed to a real slippery place. When they say, hey, I want to go out and spend the evening with my friends tonight, go out and do some fun stuff, that's all well and good. But keep in mind, they may be headed to a slippery place. A place where damage can be done, where disaster can ensue that nobody was expecting. And it's not that your child has somehow planned and put together and connived this idea that's going to ruin their life. I honestly believe most of the lives that I've seen ruined were ruined just like that in a minute when nobody even was thinking. Meaning what? Meaning that you can be in control of your life, but all at once you can be out of control. And I believe there's very often a lot of repentance goes on in that moment, but it's a little too late. When you find yourself on ice, you're going to go where you're going to go. Thou didst set them in slippery places. May I say to you, when you find yourself or when you contemplate or recognize, I should say, that there's going to be some slippery places in your life. Uh, some of the fellows in church have had times here in the past where they've changed career fields or changed jobs or moved from one to another. People getting married. Uh, all of those things can be very slippery places. Meaning what? Meaning a place where you and I can lose the control that we might desire to have and find ourselves at the mercy of the circumstances around us. Not everybody that messes up their life, not everybody that walks away and quits serving the Lord says, well, that's it, I'm an atheist starting right now. They just found themselves in a slippery spot, and it took them out of control, whichever way they were accustomed to going. And the truth is, I think there are a lot of people that have lost control of their lives and lost value in their lives and lost the presence of God in certain circumstances in their lives because they didn't prepare with the thought in mind, we may encounter ice. I have probably flown, I think I counted the other day, well over half a million miles on the airlines. And the most annoying part, well, I can't say the most, everything is annoying to me about airlines, but... One of the most annoying things is when you go out and you get on the plane and after, you know, you have to be there four days early, whatever it is, and you roam up and down and the best coffee is always at the end of the other side of the airport down there. And when you get there, they just sold out of your favorite coffee, whatever it is. And at any rate, I'm not real keen. My wife can tell you she has to go with me. She leads me like a blind man through the airport. She says, we need to go here and and calm down and we're all right. I just, for whatever reason, I'm just out of control. And uh, so having said that, uh, we look at, I forgot where I was going with all that. In an airport, what were we doing? Oh, I know what it was. The most, most annoying facet of my airline travel is when you have to wait and go through all of that stuff, get in your seat and sit there until everybody else is on their seat. And then they have to come and tell you, how to buckle your seatbelt, although they told you five minutes ago they can't close the door till all the seatbelts are buckled. You would assume since they shut the door, all the seatbelts are buckled, but then why would they need to tell you now how to buckle your seatbelt? Isn't that a little late? Anyway, uh, all of that is incredibly annoying to me. And then they begin to taxi out and they turn the airplane and they begin to roll and the pilot says, well, ladies and gentlemen, I hate to inform you, it's going to be just another few minutes. When they say that, that's the first lie they've told you. Uh, That's like saying we're not going to crash as they're falling straight down to the ground. Uh, 
hate to hate to bother you with this, but we're going to have to move over here. We're going to be de-iced. And uh, de-icing to me, I'm glad they do it. Don't get me wrong. I'm glad, you know, better than the alternative. But it's just annoying to me because it seems like once you get there, you relax. And you say, okay, now I'm on my way to my destiny. Oh, nope, not quite yet. Okay. And then they come and they spray this stuff all over the airplane. And I'm glad they do it. But they do it because they know the danger. The danger of ice. Uh, that ice on an airplane is incredibly detrimental. An airplane's all about airflow. And uh, anything that messes the airflow can cause that airplane. Uh, somebody said, what does it mean to stall an airplane? It just means that an airplane no longer has the velocity to continue flying. And that's not the dangerous part. If an airplane stalls, that means both wings stall and it dips. If one wing stalls, it means it does this. So that's really dangerous. There's your airline lesson for this morning. All right, how's that? Slippery places, ice. It's not a good place to be. It's a dangerous predicament to be in. I think it's good to plan beforehand. I'm glad they ice the aircraft before it takes off rather than after it crashes. I can't imagine it would be much good at that point. Let me give you some things this morning. Maybe you're facing some of those decisions in your life. Maybe you're looking at one of those places in life, one of those life-changing experiences. Maybe you're contemplating something that is going to change drastically. Maybe you've had enough. Maybe you're fed up. Maybe you're going to have to change this or that. Recognize the fact that life is very often moving along at a very, very fast pace. And we don't know it because we're moving along with it. But all at once, there may be some brake lights, and we may find ourselves in a slippery place. The psalmist found out that God took those people that he was envying, the people that he thought, boy, they've got it great, they've got it neat, I wish I could be like them. Why is it we have to live this life? And they get, and then he recognized they're on ice. And all that changes the perspective, because you realize they're not even in control. They think they are, but they're not even in control. Write these things down. It is wise to contemplate your path before. Before. Meaning what? Before you're in a position that might merit knowing something about ice. Contemplate. Jeremiah 13 verse 6 says, Give glory to the Lord your God before He caused darkness and before your feet stumble upon the dark mountains. And while ye look for the light, lest He turn it into the shadow of death and make it gross darkness. You know what He was warning people? He was warning His people to be preemptive in their approach to life. Think this through. How many times have we seen disasters in our lives and in the lives of other places and we said, well, didn't they think? Didn't they realize this? Didn't they understand? And the truth is, no, they didn't. And it's not because they were dumb or stupid. It's because they didn't take the time to think about where this thing's going to lead or could lead. I've seen people do all kinds of things with justifiable excuses. And may I simply say this, to me and in my thinking, an excuse is nothing more than a way to put off conscientiously thinking about what might result in this thing. Well, you know, I just really feel. Well, wait till you find out you're on slippery place and see how you feel then. Don't trust your feelings. Well, you know, preacher, I've always wanted this. Listen, don't want your wants guide you. Make sure you check very carefully before you get there, before you make this jump, before you make this decision, because you may have a completely wrong perspective. Do you ever notice when you have your eyes set on something or when your desire is leaning that way, how much different it looks than it would have in normal life? You know, there are people here this morning, and I say this without even hesitation, there are some people here this morning that desire more than anything in the world to have what some people sitting within 20 feet of you have had and thrown it away. And we're just eat up with it. Oh, I got to have that. If I had that, my life would be now three rows down. There's somebody there that's had that and it made them miserable. We need to think about life before we reach those places where decisions have to be made. Had I known I was going to be on ice, you know what I'd have done? I'd have slowed down, maybe gotten off the interstate, 
pulled into a nice little restaurant and ordered a cheeseburger. You say, why? Much better place to spend the next hour and a half than where I spent the next hour and a half. Contemplate. Think about where this is going to be. I've said before, I love to ask young people and even adults, where do you want to be in five years? Tell me what your dreams are. Tell me where your your path would lead. Tell me where do you see yourself in five years or ten years. Now then, having told me all that, is where you are going to come out there if you do what you're going to do? And very often I've seen him say, well, no, I'm going to have to. Then you're never going to be where you see yourself in five or ten years. The key is find where God wants you to be ten years from now and then start a path toward that. And not go the all different ways that will avail themselves to you in the course of life. This guy had a completely different perspective. Notice this in verse number 2. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. Listen to this guy. You know what his heart attitude is? His heart attitude is what I classify as poochy lip. Everybody gets to do this. Everybody has fun. Everybody has a good life. Everybody enjoys. But you know, as for me, you know that's how the devil works. He sends us the delusion that somehow what we've got just isn't worth anything. Because look at those people. Look at that guy. Look at what she's doing. Boy, how far they've gone. And then there's me. Doesn't that sound like, but as for me? That's what he said. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps. You know what he thought? He thought he was in a slippery place and he was the one on solid ground. He realizes later on, you set them in slippery places. Sometimes if you're standing still and you're looking around and people are sliding, you might think you're on slippery ground yourself, but you're not. I find Christians, if they're not careful to keep their mind straight and their mind right, they get a wrong attitude toward this world. Do you realize they have to pay people to pretend to be somebody they are not, nor never have been, nor never will be? They pay them great amounts of money in order to pretend to be that so you can watch it and wish you were those people that never existed. What a crazy world we live in. Don't tell me you haven't turned off the television and kind of kicked back and said, Oh boy, if I just had the money they had and if I was as popular and if I could be such a debonair strong. Listen, they're all fakes. They're all frauds. They have to change their look. You know, you say, well, she's so pretty. She's pretty after two and a half hours of makeup three times a day. Yeah, she's glamorous. Oh, if I could just look like that, if you had to pay the price to look like that, that she has to pay to look like that, you'd say, forget it. I'm happy with plain. (laughs) People following around with brushes and making sure, you know, and put a little bit here and, you know, okay, now you can go. Wouldn't you love to do that just so people would go, oh, I wish I could look like that. You could if you paid $50,000 a year for somebody to follow you around and do all the stuff that they do. We get into an insane situation. We look at the, we get envious of the world. Oh, if I just had what they have, then you'd have the payments they have. Well, if I could just go where they go, you could sleep in a different motel room every night. If I just, if I just, we look at it from a perspective of envy, which is not reality. Every once in a while, I sit on an airplane and somebody says, my first flight... I'm really excited. And I think, don't be. <laughs> the seat just, you just paid $785 for, you could have bought the whole seat and put it in your living room for 35 <laughs> And you're going to sit in it while it bounces and joggles, and, and there's a TV, and it's over there, and you can almost see the corner of it if the sun's not shining in the window. And uh, they're going to bring you something to eat. You're going to get now no peanuts. No peanuts anymore, which was the only thing I liked in the first place. <laughs> And they say, well, you know, people have allergies. I I have an allergy for not getting peanuts on an airplane flight. (laughs) And what do you want? Would you like like whatever it is? And and I would like a Coke. And then they give you a cup about this. No, I meant a Coke, a can. Well, you have to ask for a can. Why? You asked me what I wanted. I want a Coke. And that's just the way it goes. Life is frustrating in reality. But envy takes all of that away and brings glamour in its place. And we think, somebody said, do you ever fly first class? I've flown first class two times because they messed something up really bad. Other than that, 
I can't afford to fly first class. But you know what I've noticed? I've always looked up there and seen those people. All they get is they get the same food I get on a glass plate. (laughs) They get their coffee in a glass cup. I get mine in a paper cup. I'm figuring, you know, for twice the price, I can live with paper cups. So that's kind of the way, what are you saying? I'm saying we need to contemplate reality before we find ourselves. Hey, are you saved this morning? Are you on your way to heaven? If you drop dead with a heart attack in the next 20 seconds, name for me one bad thing that's going to happen to you. And yet we're enamored with this world. Oh, I wish I could. That's where this guy is. He says, notice, but as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw, underline it, the prosperity of the wicked. Everybody knows that wickedness just takes you to the top and just makes you really popular. And boy, it's just, that's the best way to live. And do you understand that's one of the biggest lies you and I could ever believe? We've watched all this stuff go on. You watch Hollywood for a long time. Somebody said, you know, she's so pretty. Look at her in 50 years. Huh? When, when they don't have anybody to follow her around anymore and they don't have enough putty to fill in all those crevasses. And, and look at her then. And then we say, oh, she was such a wonderful star in her day. What a compliment. Sweetheart, it ain't your day anymore. <laughs> Trust me. I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. There are no bands in their death. Their strength is firm. These people are just courageous giants. And really? They're not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued. You know, people that just have all the things. They never face difficulties. Never, never, never. They just, you and I are the ones that have the problems. At least that's what we tell ourselves. You say, what is this? This is a giant pity party. This is somebody who's not thinking straight. Therefore, pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. The text there is indicating, why wouldn't they be proud? They've got everything going their way. No, they don't. No, they don't. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart can wish. Don't you know that? That's true. At least of everybody else but you. They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. Why? Because they've just got everything they want. They set their mouths against the heaven. They don't even respect God. And sometimes we envy that. I have to find out what God wants. I've asked teenagers before in the course of their graduating from high school. I said, what are you going to do? Well, I'm, I'm kind of waiting on the Lord. As though the Lord's late. As though, well, I'm waiting for the disaster to come. He's going to have to tell me I've got to go to Bula Bula land as a missionary here. We dread the Lord and the things of the Lord. That's what this crowd is. Hey, contemplate before you find yourself in a slippery place. Hey, this morning, good time. Think about where you are. Would you trade places with the richest lost man who's going to die in 15 minutes? I mean, if you could own the world for the next hour, is it worth it? What shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? We very often apply that to lost people. Hey, how about applying it to you as Christians? Why would you envy somebody that was in that predicament? He said, I was envious. Young people, why would you envy some Hollywood starlet that will never know a happy marriage in their lifetime? They'll go from husband to husband or from wife to wife over and over again. They'll be abused. They'll be cheated. They'll be lied about. They'll be laughed at. And then they'll stand up and they'll give them a little golden monkey man. And they'll think they're the greatest in the world, at least this year. And then we'll start all over. And some of you would give up a walk with God if you could get that. He said, I was envious. Hey, contemplate where your path is going to lead out beforehand. You say, well, I can always turn around. Not if you're in a slippery place. You see, if the devil can get you headed in that direction at a high enough velocity and get you in a slippery place, you'll want to turn around. You'll wish you could turn around. You would beg God to let you turn around, but you're going the way the momentum's taking you. I have talked to enough junkies and drug addicts who've told me I never wanted to be here and I wish to God I could get away. You say, well, they just were. No, I'll tell you what. They were desirous of something and they always felt like they had control and they could stop it in an instant and turn it around. But they found out they were on a slippery place. Contemplate beforehand 
where will this take me if I find myself in a slippery place? Number one, number two, excuse me. When you contemplate that there may be a slippery place in your life, slow down. Slow down and don't look back. Slow down. We move at such a fast pace anymore. I got to do this. I got to go there. I got to go there. Every once in a while, it's probably good. I, I'm not a, I, I'm not a, a cell phone kind of guy. And I, again, you do what you do. I'm going to do what I do. I'm thinking I'm going back to a flip phone. You say, why? I don't even want to have my schedule with me anymore. I just, I don't care. You say, well, I needed to get in touch with you. We'll call somebody else. You say, you don't even care about me. Not 24 hours a day, seven days a week. No, I don't. We're all so intertwined in everybody else's life that we can't really enjoy the moment until I find out whether they would enjoy the moment and how would they would put a thumbs up or a smiley face? How would it go? And, oh, okay, yeah, I can laugh now. What was the joke? I'm not into that. Listen, it's okay to slow down. It's okay to spend some time and contemplate. It's okay to find a place where there's some quiet and turn off all the electronics and actually think for a little while. And actually ponder what's going on with your pathway you're on and make some decisions based on that rather than what everybody, how many likes they have. Slow down. Don't look back. That's a sin that a lot of older folks like us have. When we find ourselves in a situation like that, it's always, well, boy, if I had, and you know, if I'd just back there, and if I'd done this, and I'd done that. You know one of the worst things you can do when you're on ice is look back? I watch some of these skaters on ice, and they do all these fancy things and jump up and all this kind of stuff. And, and I, I got to believe the worst wipeout you can have is when you're skating backwards. I've seen them skate into the wall. I've seen them go up in the air and... You know, uh, I've seen all that, but I, I got to believe the worst calamity that there could be is skating backwards, waving with a smile and, <clears throat> and hitting a wall. And yet you've seen Christians like that. And I've seen people like that making these wonderful plans and never look. They, you know what? They're always looking the wrong direction. We like to stop and look back and ponder what could have been and what might have been. And, you know, it's just a wonderful. And all at once we live in the past. And we look at the things in the past, and the only thing that can make us happy are the things in the past. And we find ourselves looking back there, and learn, and all at once, everything in front of us is nothing. Before you find yourself in a slippery place, slow down. Or when you find yourself in a slippery place, take your feet off of the gas pedal. I literally, we saw car after car slide sideways, just down the slightest little incline. Something about finding yourself in a slippery place. Number next, keep your eyes in the right place. Don't look back, but then again, not just that, but in life, keep your eyes on the Lord. All these things I read here about the ungodly, they're prospering and they're doing well and they're doing... We know that it's all a a false statement, a false thought, but he bought into it. Why? He had his eyes in the wrong place. But when he got to this place over here... He got his eyes in the right place. Psalm 73, 17, he said, Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. Somebody said, why do I need to go to church? You don't have to go to church to go to heaven. You don't have to go to church to be moderately happy, I suppose. But I tell you what going to church does. It enables you to understand where the wicked people are going to end up. It enables you to see the facade of what's out there. It enables, enables you to recognize, you know what, they talk about happiness and they talk about all this and they don't have any of it. It enables you to keep your perspective in that sense. Keep your eyes in the right place. He said, I was in a mess until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then understood I their end. Quit looking at where they are and look at where they end. I'm not preaching just to young people, but they seem to be catching my attention this morning because they're all so good at it, and we're all so good at it as well. You know who we envy? We envy people that haven't reached the end of the road they're on yet. Hello? You know who I envy? I envy my dad. I envy my mom. Say why? I can stand at their graveside and realize, you know what? They lived a good life. They loved God. They served God. And they're not fighting any battles anymore. Anybody you could name for me today that's living and walking on two feet in this world, you say, boy, you could envy them, could you? You don't know how it's going to end. 
You don't know where their life's going to take them, and you don't know what's going to happen with them. I mean, I can think of football players that were all-stars a few years ago, and now they're nothing. You say, why? Because they planted their foot just the wrong way on the turf. Because somebody hit them just the wrong way. You say, well, we should feel sorry for them. I I suppose, but don't tell me that that makes you great if somebody feels sorry for you. They're what might have been and now never will be. The truth of the matter is until a life is run, until the tale is told, there's no way to determine. I prayed for years, God, don't let me become a mean, nasty, ugly old man. And so far, I got everything but the ugly out of the way. <laughs> Why? I don't want to die bitter. I don't want to die angry. I don't want to die going, if only I had, and I wish I could. I want to be able to say, hallelujah, what a good life. I'd love to live it all over again, same way, same station. There's not enough of that in this life. Everybody's dying with regrets. That comes very often from not keeping your eyes in the right place. You know what Paul said? I fought a good fight. I finished my course and I kept the faith. What else can you ask for? He said, I got in the car. I didn't wreck it on the way and I got to the destination. That's a great trip, isn't it? But everybody wants so much more. Keep your eyes in the right place. Don't put your eyes in the wrong place. Contemplate beforehand what would happen if you found yourself in this path and it became a slippery place. Number next, follow your leader. You know, I'm not really keen on driving 15, 10 miles an hour. That's just not in me. I was in a Bible conference this year with Dr. Paul Chapel, And Dr. Paul Chapel had that day, they gave him the keys to a brand new, what was that thing? Car. Uh, Dodge. No, but it wasn't just a charger. It was the 700 horsepower charger. Uh, they tell me they'd had it to 202 miles an hour on the interstate. All I know is the next day they gave me the keys. And I thought I was going to put this puppy through its paces. It had paddle shifters on the steering wheel because you can't reach anything else. And I came out of there and did the Baptist thing, made sure there's no police this way or this way. (laughs) Said a quick prayer, deliver us from evil. And pushed that thing down about two-thirds of the way. And those tires, they didn't squall at all. That thing was like being shot out of a bullet. I was hanging on to the steering wheel. And I looked down in about three seconds. It was at 70 miles an hour. And I said, that's enough for me. And I went in and took the keys back. You say, why? It was exciting. But you know what? Boy, things just get out of control real quickly if you're not careful. You want to contemplate before you head out. You want to slow down when you see something that may cause difficulty in life. You want to keep your eyes in the right place and not put them in the wrong place. And it's really nice if you can pay attention to what's going on ahead of you. I don't like to drive 10 miles an hour, but that night I was really happy to be driving about 2 miles an hour. And I was really, really happy to have about 8 or 10 cars in front of me. You say, why? Because they kept me going two miles an hour. Because I'm not a two mile an hour kind of guy. And if there had been nobody in front of me, I might have said, yeah, you can go five. And then I just said, ah, you can go ten. And then I just said, oh, no. That's just the way it works, isn't it? Our pride and ego takes over, and that's where I was glad to have somebody there setting a pace for me. Somebody there keeping me from doing what I fully thought I could have done. I was really appreciative of them when I began to see those cars sliding sideways up there in front of me and realizing, you know what? (laughs) Those are protecting me. They're setting a pace for me. They're helping me guide my own vehicle and my own life. Young people, find somebody, find a mentor in life, preferably somebody that walks with God and understands God, somebody that can give you good direction. Put trust in your mom and your dad and the experiences of their life. And if they, you've got to slow down to follow them, it's all right. Slow down and follow them. You'll learn a lot of lessons following along with those that are in front of you. Find somebody that does what you want to do. Somebody said, well, you know, here's what I want to be. I want to be, a, I want to be this. 
I said, well, do you know anybody that does that? Well, no. Well, did you ever meet anybody? Well, no. Listen, if you want to, whatever you want to be, find somebody that's doing it. There's a lot of people talking about it today. Everybody in the world calls you, say, hey, I've got a program. We can help you get from A to B with no problems, and we can show you how it's done. And, hey, have you ever done it? No, I'm a salesman. Nothing wrong with being a salesman, but you're not going to sell rocket science if you're a salesman. You're not going to be very convincing. Follow people that have done it. Hey, have you got a good mom and dad? Follow them. It'll help you be a good mom or a good dad. Uh, You say, well, I've got to then find somebody that had a good mom or dad and find somebody that's done it. Find somebody that's been successful at it. Find somebody that's walked that path and follow the leader. More importantly, keep your eyes on the Lord. Keep your eyes on the Lord. I'm thankful for earthly leaders and earthly influences in my life, but I am more thankful that the Lord has been there in overwhelmingly unusual ways. Where I thought this was the path to go and all at once something just stopped everything in its tracks. And about the time I'm ready to blame God, I realize, you know what? He's been my best friend yet once again. He's helped me. Learn in life to follow your leader wherever he goes. Wherever he leads, I'll follow. That ought to be the slogan of a life. Psalm 73 verse 23. When he got all said and done of envying these people and then realizing their life was a disaster waiting to happen. Here's what he said in verse 23. Nevertheless, I'm continually with thee. And thou hast holden me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and afterward receive me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire. You know what will bring you closer to the Lord? Getting on a real slippery place in your life. Finding yourself completely out of control and realizing you're not what you thought you were. And you don't have the control you thought you had. And boy, it doesn't take but that much for you just to end up in it. It's good sometimes to be there. Because it will make you thankful for a God that can help steer you straight. When everything else falls apart. He didn't start out that way. He started out with, I envied the wicked. Boy, I wish I could be like them. They're not like other people. They've got this and they've got that. and They don't have problems. And he had an unrealistic perspective. But in the end, he said, who have I but you? You're the only friend I've got. You're the only one that I need. Life is filled with slippery places. Hey, by the way, when you find yourself in a slippery place and all at once it's over with and you thank the Lord and praise the Lord, learn the lesson. One of the sad things in life is not that people find themselves in slippery places. That happens to all of us. Not the saddest thing that they find themselves in a slippery place and there's damage done and things that they regret and wish that hadn't happened and things they'll have to deal with and live with. And that's sad enough. But the sad thing is when it's all said and done, they turn around and go right back down the same road again. Learn your lesson. Learn your lesson. You know, the reason I sat this morning and looked at the ice in the trees and noticed the fact there weren't any cars coming down my street, trying to contemplate on what I should do. And somebody said, you know, when do you cancel church? Rarely, if ever. You say, why? I can tell you my reason, because if I don't cancel, some of you inevitably would show up. And I'd feel about that high as a pastor knowing that my people would get out when I wouldn't. So, if I kill myself, it's your fault. (laughs) But as I was contemplating that this morning, you know what? My mind went back to that thing five, ten years ago. I'll never forget that. Because it was at that moment I realized what a slippery place really was. And I'm going to be honest with you. This morning, a lot of us are going to encounter in the course of our life, saved or lost, we're going to find ourselves in some slippery places. We may look to the world and seek the world's advice, but it'll never merit much. It's not much help to find out from somebody that hit the wall and destroyed their whole life how to hit the wall and destroy your own life. I'd rather know how to avoid it, and I'd rather learn that from somebody that did avoid it. Ultimately, I have to have the Lord's guidance. But truth of the matter is, Keep those things in mind. Keep those things in mind. I have two, three places in my mind I would never tell anybody on the face of this earth. But they're in my mind. Places where I came this close.
to completely, totally destroying my life. You say, why do you keep them in mind? I want to remember what a slippery place is like. You say, why? Because I may find myself in another one someday. And I want to realize, no, 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 no. There's no coming back from this. There's no fixing this. The psalmist said, I was envious of the wicked. I I desired to be like them. I emulated what they were doing. And he said, how foolish I was when he got his right mind. He said, I don't have anybody but you, God. You've got to guide me. You've got to help me. Would you bow your heads this morning just for a moment? May I say to you, there are slippery places in the course of life. It doesn't just happen in the winter time. Sometimes it happens at an unexpected time. Sometimes it happens when the conditions around wouldn't indicate that it would or could happen. Sometimes it's just a calamity that's waiting on us to get to it because we've traveled down a wrong path. Sometimes it's an inevitability and sometimes it's purely circumstantial. Sometimes other people can cause a slippery place in our life. Sometimes it's people that we love. Sometimes it's people that we're angry with. But there are slippery places in abundance in the course of life in which we walk. And the psalmist said, I was envious of the wicked. I wanted to be just like them. And boy, what an answer. He said, till I went to the house of God. I submit to you, it's good to stay in church. It's good to come and hear some preaching. You may not like the preacher. You may not like what he's saying. And you may think he's just an old fuddy-duddy. But somewhere down the road, you may think, boy, I'm glad I listened to that. I'm glad I heard that. I'm glad I put up a warning flag in my life at that point. It's not just for young people, though. Can I be honest tonight? I've seen more adults over 50 ruin their lives than I've seen young kids under 20. There's no time when that foolishness runs out. And the truth of the matter is, if we're not careful, even old and experienced, we can hit some ice and we'll lose control and momentum will take us in the direction we may not want to go anymore.